uh, Dr. Sanders Marble. Uh, he will talk about medical support to the 36th Division in World War I. And, and this session is sponsored by the Texas State Genealogical Society. Thank you. They have been a good partner for many years now. Uh, Dr. Marble received his AB from the College of William and Mary and MA and PhD from King's College, London. He has written a variety of books, articles, and chapters on aspects of World War I and medical history. He has worked in various capacities in the Army Medical Dis Department history program since 2003, including being the command historian at Walter Reed Army Medical Center. He is a guest curator for the Army Medical Department Museum's temporary exhibit on World War I, currently on exhibit, and he has contributed to the World War I uh, Commemoration Commission's web pages on medicine and World War I. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Marble. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm glad to see there wasn't really an exodus. Um, uh, since uh, I'm giving a, a version of this talk uh, for the Texas Military Forces Museum, uh, that's the Camp Mabry folks on Wednesday, and that one I, I decided to broaden this one from just the 36th um, uh, to slightly encourage you to, to come to that if you get a chance. Um, I work for the Army. Uh, I, I work for your government, so uh, I need to in include this disclaimer. These are uh, my comments, not the uh, official views of the United States government. You'll see parts of that throughout this. Uh, now, uh, as uh, Jeff Warrow uh, alluded to earlier, and, and uh, Jeff Hunt in, in a different way, um, in World War I, just as today, uh, the military had a wide-ranging responsibility for soldiers' health. Uh, what I'm going to do here is talk sort of chronologically through uh, a man's experience with uh, the, the military health department, or uh, Army Medical Department. Uh, from them being a recruit through uh, their service and out uh, at the far end. So medical care for soldiers starts by deciding who's going to be a soldier. Who is fit to be a soldier? Um, and you don't want those with an incurable disease, those who are already uh, uh, too weak to do the job and who are going to break down. Uh, and they also, in World War I, add uh, or substantially increase the the mental standards, um, because they have a concept that you, uh, you can break down, uh, and we can screen for that. It's, um, so the, the Army's idea was that um, uh, health is good for you, and, and it's also good for the Army, because you are, uh, the individual soldier is going to be fit for duty. The, uh, about 30 percent of uh, guys who uh, volunteered or, or came forward from the draft uh, were rejected as unfit, uh, which is a, a reminder that um, uh, even then uh, there were lots of unfit people, not so much from obesity, uh, but uh, people who'd been injured uh, or just had some congenital disease. So inducting men is a multi-phase process. The military loves to break things down and they managed to fit all of these things into one pr uh, prefab building. Um, uh, the, the medical screening included uh, the body. Uh, you've got, okay, you've got records, and then you've got things like TB screening. Um, there were uh, venereal disease screenings, uh, heart examinations, and such as that. Uh, but they also, did, they did include the mind, um, and we're still struggling with it. Uh, a few years ago, there was a congressman who asked, hey, well, instead of worrying about PTSD, and uh, why don't you just screen guys you know, who, who are going to volunteer for the Army and, and avoid the whole problem? And the Army said, that would be great, but we haven't figured out a test yet. We've been working on it. They also have some very new things to deal with, like flying. Well, who is fit to be a flyer? We would rather not crash the airplanes because we're putting the wrong guy in the cockpit. There are a lot of diseases that we've basically wiped out now. Um, 20,000 guys come into the Army with hookworm. Well, hookworm's not so much of a problem. I, I, I've met one person that knew of one other person with hookworm. Now, um, Texas looks pretty good if you consider that 12% of, uh, of your military age males having hookworm is good. Um, and it, that's, the number is lower, I think, because it's only going to be prevalent in East Texas. Malaria is still endemic in the United States. We are a generation before DDT spraying of bugs. Uh, 
So the only way to clear out malaria from an area is to dig lots of drainage ditches, uh, drain the swamp, to, to borrow a phrase. Uh, and that is a huge undertaking uh, in time and effort. Um, and the Army works on that. Uh, uh, Fort Eustace is in uh, swampy Virginia, swampy part of Virginia. Uh, they work on that. They know that the bugs, the mosquitoes, can fly from off post to on post. They work with state and local health departments. Uh, and that also goes on to working with state and local health departments for clean restaurants, um, clean cities. So they work on uh, uh, red light districts, which I'll come to in a minute. Once the guys are accepted into the Army, there is uh, a huge emphasis on preventive, me uh, preventive maintenance. No, sorry, preventive medicine, if you think of it in the same way. There are very few therapeutic drugs in this period. We are 25 years before penicillin is uh, uh, available. I mean, it's discovered in the, the 20s, but it's really only available in the 40s. So an ounce of prevention, it really is worth a pound of cure. The Army ha had pioneered typhoid vaccination in 1908. Uh, and the mandatory administration of typhoid vax uh, really reduces the rate of infection. Good, that red circle is visible. Um, the four million man army had a total of uh, 1,529 cases of typhoid during World War I uh, brought in from civilian life. So typhoid is still prevalent in, in society. Why is the army interested in typhoid? Well, it has a, uh, they had a 15% fatality rate. So that, um, by having only 1,500 cases, they only lost 227 soldiers. But you don't have a lot of today's immunizations. Um, these numbers add up um, disease by disease, uh, chickenpox, scarlet fever, measles. Uh, and if you can avoid getting the guys sick, you also don't have to hospitalize them and provide expensive, relatively expensive hospitals and nursing care and, and doctors and such. So you can uh, reduce your costs overall. And those guys will be ready to train and they'll be better trained when they do go over to France. Uh, measles uh, infected uh, about 18% of the army during the winter of 1917-18. Yeah, that's one in five guys coming down with measles. You don't have immunizations back then. And something that's particularly applicable in Texas is that people from uh, low population density areas, ranches, farms, uh, small towns, if, the, if they don't happen to have encountered the disease, uh, then they're, when they do go to a big city or a, bi a big mobilization camp, that's when they'll get sick because the big city kids uh, will bring it with them. Um, so the disease rates are much higher in the, uh, for the rural uh, units. Without drugs to treat these diseases, they, you basically, yes, you're sick, we can't do anything for you, stay in the hospital until you get better. Chickenpox, you're in the hospital for 18 days on average. Scarlet fever, uh, 43 days. Um, measles, 19 days. So they really do want to keep guys uh, healthy in the first place. Um, I am not speaking for the Army, again. Uh, VD was prevalent in society, uh, and you know, th there were two therapeutic drugs for it. Uh, one of them was mercury. Mercury is poisonous. The other one was arsenic. Arsenic is poisonous. <laughs> so you've got drugs that are drugs when they're at exactly the right dose. And if, they, you know, if the doctor pulls a little bit too much into his syringe or, um, or miscalculates your weight, he's going to poison you. Um, you know, they, they can't just give you a shot of penicillin and these things go away. So VD is prevalent in society. The Army has to deal with tens of thousands of guys starting out with VD. Oh, and some guys happen to get VD while they're in uniform. We don't know how it happens, but the Army has to deal with it. Um, they try to avoid enlisting VD sufferers. They discourage soldiers from getting infected. They try to scare them straight. And none of, knowing that none of this will be successful, they have to treat this. Um, uh, but they, they really cannot ignore the problem. And again, it's because they want to ignore, uh, avoid days lost. This is uh, about four million days lost from gonorrhea and, and about two million from CIF. Uh, that's 15 days hospitalization for gonorrhea and a month off duty if you have come down with syphilis. This hampers training. You know, the Army may, may or may not be concerned with your morals, 
but they do worry that they are losing your service for this period of time and paying for the privilege of you being in a hospital bed while somebody else has to do the job. Uh, the medical department tries to get a, a healthy environment through a number of avenues. Um, they want to have a reasonable amount of cubic space per person so that you're not breathing in your neighbor's air. Uh, you know, maybe they're sneezing, maybe they're producing some bodily odors that you don't enjoy. Uh, but you know, if, if you're further apart, that's going to be less of a problem. That's a good idea. But in the winter of 1917-18, you have a huge construction backlog as these temporary camps, let's see, I was told to use the green one, the temporary, these exciting temporary wooden buildings, you know, even those are hard to complete on time. So guys, in the middle of winter, uh, this is uh, Camp uh, Bowie outside Fort Worth, um, yet, and that is uh, a couple feet of snow on the ground. They are in these pyramidal tents uh, into November, December. And lo and behold, there are outbreaks of, uh, massive outbreaks of disease up there. Um, one camp had 45% of its men sick with childhood diseases of the, over the winter of 1718. Uh, they can't go outside to train. They're trapped inside just because it's too bitter. Uh, and, and the Army is, says, yes, we understand that there will be a higher disease rate, but we need to generate troops over in France. So we'll, we will accept uh, the, the, mor the morbidity, the, the uh, disease occurrence. Uh, we'll accept more troops being sick, and we'll accept that some of them will die because we have to have the output of trained troops. Um, uh, so you would get nine guys crammed into a tent like that. Um, the Army Surgeon General, the governor of Texas, uh, Texas legislators all go and, and metaphorically bang on the Army's door. Uh, some of them from inside the Army saying this is wrong, and the Army says, yes, we know it's wrong, and, and we're working on it, but we don't have a solution right now. Something that's easier, uh, food safety. You know, they know how quickly uh, 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 stomach bugs pass around. Uh, they have recently had the experience of uh, the embalmed beef scandal in the Spanish-American War, so they're very careful about kitchens. Uh, dishes are washed and rinsed. Food waste is handled. They sell the pig uh, slops to pig farmers. They, they get the uh, horse manure uh, off post so that the flies don't go from the manure piles into the kitchens. They use municipal water supplies where those exist. They build their own water supplies where they don't. They, they tie into municipal sewers if possible. They know how to do the sanitation stuff. What you don't get are things like uh, occupational health. You have lead paint where there's paint at all. Um, you don't have earplugs. You know, they, they don't know about these things. Um, guys die before they, you know, the average life expectancy is about 50. People die before they go deaf uh, at this point. And then the Occupational Safety and Health Administration is 60 years in the future. Now they know there's gonna be guys getting sick, so every uh, mobilization camp gets a hospital uh, to treat the people that fall sick there, and then they go out and get uh, organize uh, general hospitals uh, off the main uh, off the training posts to handle the patients that are uh, more than a, the, that are a more complicated patient. Um, you know, you get uh, compound comminuted. You you really shatter your leg instead of just a nice clean break. Um, but even this surgical ward at the bottom here, you know, these are not. Uh, this is the standard of care. Um, there, are no, there are no ICUs at this point. They don't do IVs. Uh, medicine is, is as uh, specialized as it could be, but it's still not sophisticated. This is an, uh, an ENT clinic. Um, again, it, it is specialized, but it, it's really not sophisticated. The peacetime hospital system was unsurprisingly sized for the peacetime army. Uh, peacetime army of about 100,000 guys, uh, hospital system, about 5,000 beds. That's still way more than we would have today for that number. Uh, and during the war, it goes up, uh, the Army goes up to 4 million. Um, and then this chart starts uh, eight months into the war, and they still only have uh, 5,000 beds um, for the hospital system. They, they knew that they would need the hospitals when the casualties come back from the war, and they say, well, we can wait on that, uh, which was a calculated risk, and it worked. 
By the armistice, they go from 5,000 beds in, in January of 1918 to 29,000 in November. Um, 80% of those are occupied. Uh, they have 52,000 camp hospital beds, 90% uh, occupied. Most of that's flu, and I'll get to that later. But you can see most of the hospitals are over in uh, central and eastern US. And that's because that's where the population is. This, the hatching, the darker hatching is a uh, more dense population. And they also put the hospitals on the east coast because that's where the ships bringing guys back from Europe are going to be docking. They're not going to be docking in Chicago. Uh, uh, so the, the hospital is ready, is both near the patient's homes, relatively, and it's convenient to the ports. They also have to deal with TB. The TB hospitals are the ones I circled. Uh, they're dots in the original. Uh, uh, because TB, I mean, they don't have a drug to, to treat TB. TB is treated either by going to a dry climate, like Denver or uh, New Mexico, uh, or it's treated surgically by removing chunks of your lung. The Army Medical Department also has to mobilize. Uh, they, they just, you know, they have an, a medical department in 1917 that's sized for the Army of 1917. Um, I'm going to annoy all the, vet, the nurses and veterinarians and dentists in the room and focus on doctors. Um, uh, the, the regular Army had 443 doctors. It had just over 1,900 reservists, and there were a few in the National Guard. Numbers are imprecise. Uh, and that's enough for peacetime. In wartime, they go up to 30,000. So 19 out of every 20 doctors in the Army uh, have no military experience. And most of the ones that have some military experience have very limited military experience. Uh, doctors have to be allopaths, so no homeopaths, no osteopaths, no irregular practitioners was the term. They have to be male. And the Army did not make it easy for Negroes, the period term, to get commissions. But 104 uh, Negro doctors did get into the Army and ser uh, to serve with uh, colored units. Doctors were not exempt from the draft, although some of them wanted to be. Uh, so the Army has a, a easy access to lots and lots of male doctors uh, and access to enough guys to, to be uh, the enlist, uh, medical enlisted folks. Once you get the doctors, you have to teach them the things that you need them to know. Uh, not medicine per se, not you know, an, uh, anatomy and pathology or uh, probably basic surgery, uh, but you need to teach them army administration, how to order the supplies that they're going to need, uh, and things that they don't need as a civilian practitioner. A civilian you know, country doctor who goes to farmhouses and, and has a little office in town, he, doesn't, he is not responsible for sanitation at a farm. You know, you sh this is where you should put your outhouse. Uh, not his job, not his problem. An army doctor is responsible for sanitation, so they have to learn some public health. Army doctors are responsible for training the enlisted men underneath them, um, whereas a civilian doctor can work with you know, one or two assistants uh, over the years. An army doctor has to, is going to get about 30 guys under him uh, right away. They also have to get the enlisted men, uh, train them up. Um, th there are uh, not nearly as many specialties as there are now. Uh, dental and, and x-ray were basically, uh, uh, and I guess some pharmacy uh, assistants were, were about the specialties. Uh, so you get a little bit of classroom training, and then you get a bunch of on-the-job training um, at the hospitals. And they would continue the on-the-job training uh, throughout their military career. The infantry aid man, they didn't call him medics yet, was trained on bandaging and splinting. And that's it. They don't have drugs to administer. They, uh, they are not trusted to administer tourniquets. They can bandage and they can splint. Uh, and I think that's a, a reflection of the Army knowing how little training time they had. They say, well, they're not going to get trained on anything more, so we're going to not trust them very far. OK. I, I, We've mobilized our mythical doughboy. Let's ship him over to France. Again, they're, they're dealing with packing guys in this tight. Um, the, the medical department says, you will have more guys sick and, and some more guys die from this. And the army says, OK, we will. But we'll have thousands more guys over in France than if we you know, have half as many bunks in, in this amount of space. 
Uh, so what do they do? The, the doctors look in your throat to see if you're, uh, you know, there's a, a wonderful picture of a doctor walking down a line of guys who are going, ah. Uh, and they try and take temperatures, but there's all kinds of ways to, to present a lower temperature. Get over to France, uh, and again, they're, they're working on sanitation, uh, water supplies, uh, and provide uh, low acuity hospitals. A lot of units are billeted in, in farms and, um, or houses. Um, some are put in temporary buildings. Everybody agrees that the French are dirtier than we are. Uh, maybe they hadn't seen Arkansas. Okay. Um, so you, uh, but you know, you get these uh, uh, low acuity um, camp hospitals. Um, you know, guy who twists his ankle and needs to be off duty, or he's throwing up for a few days. Um, Nineteen prefab buildings. Um, you know, very low. Uh, you know, enough to to be better than the tents that you might be living in otherwise. Um, if these, if a particular camp hospital fills up with VD patients because the guys have been doing something with the mademoiselles, they will take the VD patients, move them out into tents. They will keep, they will pr continue providing care for them because that's their responsibility. But they don't have to make it any nicer than, than the bare minimum. So you know, th they're walking a tightrope on treating but not encouraging. They have to de-louse guys who end up lou uh, with lice. Um, there's a lot of dental uh, uh, procedures needed because gold is the standard restorative uh, material in these days, and most people can't afford gold fillings. Sanitation. Um. Now, moving into treating casualties, uh, there is medical support at, at every echelon uh, from the front trenches back to the rear areas. And there's no quiz on this, uh, which is, is good, because uh, you could nail me on some of, the, uh, some of these levels. And my point, and my point isn't exactly the details here, uh, but it's that they are providing care at every level. Um, every division has medical personnel built into it, uh, ambulance units, hospitals, uh, higher echelons, uh, corps and, and armies have units assigned based on expected casualties. So the, the uh, medical planners can go over to the operations planners and say, okay, how many, Casualties do you expect? And so with, with that, whatever number they, they can say, well, okay, we're gonna need this many hospitals. And then they look and they say, oh, well, we only have that many hospitals. That's how many hospitals we've got. Uh, and it does hamper care. So what are these hospitals that have to, uh, and the reason there's a shortage is that you, um, out of a, a, a fixed amount of shipping space uh, coming across the Atlantic, you, the Americans had to provide the American forces, the, uh, supplies for the American forces and supplies for our allies, uh, raw materials and finished goods both. So hospitals are competing against everything else including combat troops. Uh, so the doctors draw up lots of plans for enormous hospital system, big enough to, to hospitalize one out of every four soldiers over in France. And the general staff looks at that and says no. And they eventually whittle it down to uh, um, more like se between seven and ten percent, depending on exactly when. Um, and then that the medical units, so th th there's space allotted for them, but it gets pushed back. Well, we we, we need, right now we need we need something else. Right now we need something else. So we'll we'll get the hospitals later. So by October 1918, when we're in the Meuse Argonne fighting that, that uh, Jeff Warrow was talking about with thousands of casualties a day, we don't have enough hospitals over there. Pershing cables back, I need more hospitals, I need more nurses. And the War Department says, we'll work on that, but they won't be arriving right away. World War I is when triage, the word triage comes into English, so turning gaggles of patients into neat rows. Uh, you got your sitting wounded in the back and the, the litter cases up front. Uh, and I, I want to mention the triage priorities. Um, Today we're accustomed to trying to keep everybody alive. So the first priority is the person who's gonna die. Well, who's possibly gonna die, but, po but possibly savable. If you're absolutely gonna die, you're absolutely gonna die. Uh, when we go into World War I, the Army's priority was the guy who is going to return to duty. And then we'll go to the guys who might return to duty, and then the guys who 
might live, but they won't return to duty. And then the guys who won't, you know, we won't put anything into the guys who are going to die. Uh, and I think it's because we're shifted to a citizen army, a, a, uh, a broad-based army, uh, that the army switches its priorities to what we have today, which is trying to keep everybody alive. Uh, uh, but that's a shift during World War I. Now those uh, frontline aid men, uh, their job is to get a guy back to a doctor. Um, uh, and this is the equipment they had to work with. There's the belt, it's packed full of bandages. Um, and again, they're trained to bandage and splint. This is the, up above is the bandage. Uh, it was in, not in wax paper, it was just in paper. Uh, not protected against mud and, and uh, moisture. And you were supposed to safety pin it together. Uh, the doctor's equipment's down below. Uh, m there's more of it, but it's still not elaborate. So they're pretty well trained on splinting. Um, the battalions, the surgeons with the infantry, or the doctors with the uh, forward infantry battalions would administer morphine for pain. Um, they would also do uh, anti-tetanus serum uh, because tetanus, they couldn't uh, inoculate against tetanus yet. Then they put you in an ambulance, um, not a modern ambulance with nice soft tires moving across a smooth road with sirens going. Now, you don't run a siren in a war area, oddly enough. You don't have a paramedic on board to provide uh, en route care. You've got rough roads. Um, and as we saw with one of the earlier pictures, those roads are often full uh, of other vehicles. During the Mirza Argonne offensive, uh, patients might be 10 or more hours in the ambulance. And that's after the delay getting from where they got wounded back to the ambulance collection point, and then any delay in, once they get to a hospital getting to the operating room. So you might not get to the operating table for 50 to 60 hours with uh, you know, much better chance for uh, blood loss, infection, uh, just general death. And you know, even if they knew that getting surgery sooner was better, but they didn't have a way to, to hop over uh, the fighting with helicopters the way we can now. The field hospital, uh, the first place for significant medical treatment, um, not fancy establishments. They do not have x-rays. Uh, they are not organized with, an op with operating uh, with yeah, with operating equipment. Now the divisions will reorganize them so that one of them is, is ready for the sick, one for gas patients, and one for surgical patients. But their job is to see what your problem is. If, it's, if you're gonna get better within three days, they'll keep you. If you're gonna take more than three days to get better, then they prepare you to evacuate to the rear. They did surgery. Um, it, they tried to be aseptic. They, they certainly knew about infections, uh, but they didn't let the, the perfect be the enemy of the good. This guy has been swabbed down with iodine on his arm, um, but those surgeons are not masked and they're not gloved. So I, I hope they washed their hands. We invented mobile hospitals. Uh, actually, we copied them from the French uh, and in fact copied them down to translating the operating manuals, uh, the supply tables and, and how to run the equipment. Uh, our allies had showed that early surgery saved lives and since the field hospital was so inadequate surgically, we said this will save lives. This will return more troops to duty. We will do this. Um, they were supposed to take the non-transportable patients the guys who would die in that bouncy ambulance ride back to the evacuation hospital. These, uh, after World War II, these are gonna get called mashes, uh, but again, they do not have helicopters to fly patients uh, in, in TV or on the movies. Uh, and if you have to wait for the patients to recuperate post-operatively, once your mobile hospital has operated on somebody, then it's not mobile for the next seven to uh, 14 days. Evac hospitals, the next one back, um, they could operate in tents. This is a fl uh, wooden floored tent. They could be in buildings. Uh, they could be almost anywhere. They had more staff. Uh, they had much more, they had nurses. Um, uh, hospitals further forward uh, might not have nurses. They have x-ray machines. Um, uh, and they're a key uh, link on the chain of evacuation. Uh, without, um, 
good road evacuation, hospital trains are the main way to get patients back. Uh, and early in the Mir Zargan campaign, uh, when the, the forward hospitals overflow because we didn't have enough hospitals and, and were sending too many guys into combat and getting them shot up, they say, let's put patients on these trains and get them back to rear area hospitals for operation. It's not good, but it's the best we can do. They put 11,000 guys in pre-operative trains, um, and those, a lot of those guys end up with um, uh, more infections and end up dying. And then they, they are, take steps and move more hospitals forward. But behind, uh, well behind the lines, they built hospital centers uh, where uh, 20, uh, some, um, up to 20,000 beds. One doctor called these hospital cities uh, because they were just so big, hundreds of acres. Uh, uh, and this is where the, the patients would recuperate. They would have convalescent camps uh, as well. Now, there's a lot of medical advances during the war, mostly surgical uh, rather than medical. And because we had three years, or because our allies had three years head start on, on patching up uh, shot up soldiers, they are teaching us a lot of the state of the art. This is the first large war after antiseptic surgery. And so they're working out what's now basic wound treatment. Uh, early operation and a wide debridement was a lesson. Uh, before World War I, they thought you want to delay operation, uh, which was a logical inference from a flawed data set. But uh, they also make the decision to do uh, a, a bigger operation early uh, rather than, and maybe amputate more and, or amputate uh, earlier, rather than being able to operate four and five times on a guy. They have hundreds of thousands of patients a year. They can't do everything for everybody. So uh, rather than run the risk of a guy developing a, an infection because we didn't cut enough on him in the first place, let's just cut more in the first place. We're lucky that we're only, recently we've only been getting a few thousand wounded a year. Carol Dakin's solution was an antibiotic treatment. Um, it basically used, uh, it flushed dilute bleach through the body. Uh, it was buffered, so it was pH balanced. Um, uh, hospital wards would smell of bleach uh, because there, there was this uh, stuff coming down from the, uh, come down the bottle, uh, out of the bottle through the rubber tubing. Uh, and these are basically dribbler hoses that are uh, uh, in or on top of your wound. The uh, uh, fluid pushes bacteria. I mean, it just, it's a flush. Uh, it flushes bacteria out of the wound. The uh, bleach helps detach, uh, kills, uh, helps kill um, bacteria and also uh, chemically detaches dead uh, flesh that the surgeon may have missed. Um, so you can imagine a dribbler hose in your skin or you can not imagine it. Uh, but it turns out to be a bit of a flash in the pan. You know, the, it was supposed to be a four step process. Good surgery, then you'd have these tubes in you. Uh, and then before they sewed you up, which was step four, they made sure that uh, uh, slide, you know, lab slides showed no bacteria. Well, if you do those other three, if you do the three things and you don't have these dribbler hoses inside you, there's, you know, if you just make sure the wound is clean, um, it, it's as good. Um, it, this was supposed to speed the process up, not be a, 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 a magic cure. They're working on blood transfusion during the war. Uh, they don't know about blood groups. Um, they're doing live transfusion um, because they don't have refrigeration for uh, prolonged uh, storage. <clears throat> Excuse me. Shock gets a lot of attention. Uh, um, with replacing blood being problematic, tourniquets were controversial at the time. Uh, but they knew that if the, if the patient is cold, uh, warm them up. Uh, they learned to elevate the feet to keep the blood up around the heart and the head. And they are happy to replace volume uh, with, you know, basically uh, sugar water, Ringer's lactate, 
uh, rather because putting blood in is, is problematic. Uh, it's going to take years to determine the physiology of shock and the best treatments, but empirically they're doing what they can. We learned this lesson from the British. Uh, if you administer anti-tetanus serum early, uh, you get much lower tetanus rates. Pretty straightforward. Um, uh, so you know, we're, again, we're learning from our allies. They are doing some advanced stuff. They are doing neurosurgery, uh, not just in the skull, but they're doing some nerve grafting. Um, not every doctor is doing nerve grafting, but they're trying it. Something else we learned is uh, war psychiatry. Um, we learned, the, we sent a doctor over to the British uh, before we actually sent troops to France and said, tell us about this shell shock thing we're reading in the newspapers. And the British said, here's what we know about it. You may want to do some of this too. Um, we, we hoped to screen out the mentally weak, uh, those prone to breakdown, uh, and they correlated it with intelligence, which is not entirely true. Um, and then they realized, well, these guys who've been screened are still having breakdowns. So they said, we need to treat them. Well, what are you, guys, what are you British and French doing to treat them? And we get the answers and we implement them immediately. Treat the guys close to the front line, not at the front line, but as close as possible to the front line. Uh, treat them as quickly as you can, and treat them with the uh, expectation that they will get better and, and be able to function. Don't say, oh my gosh, you are, you are now hopeless and we have to evacuate you all the way to the rear. You will make somebody hopeless if you tell them they're hopeless. So give a guy some, uh, get him some sleep, give him some hot food, get him some rest, tell him he'll be okay. And most of these guys are, are not truly mentally damaged, permanently damaged, they're just <coughs> unable to take a bit more right now. Gas was another new thing. Uh, we suffered more proportionately because we had zero, zero experience and we walk into a sophisticated chemical battlefield. Phosgene, an, in, uh, an, in, uh, an inhalation gas was the most lethal gas we faced, but mustard gas um, a bur uh, burning or blistering agent uh, was the most common uh, problem. Low lethality, but it could cause very extensive blistering, which would keep you in the hospital for weeks or even months. Uh, this is basic treatment for uh, a blister gas, wash them off. Uh, for the inhalation gases, they used oxygen supplementation and rest, so the less load on your lungs until your lungs had recovered some and extra oxygen. But most of the casualties the US faced were uh, what we'd expected, shell fire bullets. Um, the state of the art in US surgery advanced and most of patients that arrived at a hospital survived. So after the fighting, uh, some divisions go to Germany for the occupation, most guys are coming home, um, but there's still bottlenecks to get them home. So the medical department goes back into preventive medicine, sanitation, uh, delousing, uh, uh, keeping them healthy, treating them if they fall sick. The flu epidemic hits late in the fighting, um, September, October, a little bit in September, October, November, uh, 1918. There had been a mild wave of flu uh, that went through Europe in the summer. That flu probably came back to the U.S. and mutated into the, the lethal flu, which then goes back over to Europe. There's the, the the stuff inconclusive so far. Uh, almost a quarter million flu patients in the AE, AEF. And that's only the guys who were sick enough to get into a hospital. If the hospital was full, they would say, we're full, <laughs> we can't take you. Um, uh, or the doctor would say, you're not, you know, I've got 10 guys who are sick, the, the eight sickest are gonna go to the hospital. Um, and then if you came in with with two problems, the system could only uh, account for one. So you, if you uh, were cataloged, or sorry, not cataloged, if your medical records showed the other one first, there was never a secondary diagnosis. Uh, when, when they are shipping guys back, um, they know again the troop ships will be crowded, less crowded than before, uh, but they delouse, um, they weed out the guys with respiratory diseases, and they make the guys with VD wait. 
Uh, again, it, you would have to explain to everybody in your hometown why, when everybody else came home and was in the parade all at once, why were you six weeks late, Fred? I don't know, it was the Army. The Army is responsible for long-term care. Uh, there is no VA at this point, uh, so it falls to the Army to, to take care of, of the guys. Clinical data from our allies showed that starting rehabilitation as early as possible uh, Im uh, improved patient outcomes. You, are, you get better function out of your, your body if you start rehab earlier, and you recover faster. So we say, okay, we hadn't planned to send rehabilitation people over to France, but yes, we'll do that. That's, that's clinic clinically the right thing to do. Oh, and it'll be better for the Army too. Win-win. Uh, so there's uh, physical therapists, um, civilian employees are sent over to France. Uh, hospitals were not um, segregated at this time. This is a perfectly normal photograph. Um, it happens that the, the uh, black guy, I, I think that's a double amputee. I think the, they cross-braced, um, and then the white guy is, is luckier with a single amputation. Stateside rehab takes place in a few large hospitals. They realize that it's better to, to concentrate it um, than to spread it out everywhere. Um, the Army's tried to get as much function as it could for patients, uh, and also as much aesthetic recovery as possible. This guy's jaw is gonna be as good as it can be, but he, they also did plastic surgery. I used this top chart before. Uh, the big patient load is after the fighting, uh, and that's partly because of the flu, but also because uh, they wanted to avoid the pension problem that existed after the Civil War. After, uh, the Civil War law said that if, if your military service causes you problems later on, the, the government will give you a pension. What they didn't realize was, well, these guys are going to live for a while and they're going to get arthritis or some other pro thing is going to develop. The pension law covered that. So if, you're a, if you came out of the Army completely healthy in 1865, and in 1895, you were not completely healthy. You could get paid for that. Not the Army's fault. Um, not the government's responsibility, but it was the government's responsibility. So they write a different law. They say, we are, going to we are going to treat you as much as is possible before we discharge you. We do not want, we want to pay now rather than pay later. Medical care is cheaper. Uh, you can see how much uh, this middle chart is a uh, number of uh, physical therapists going up quickly, and then the bottom one shows it going way down. Um, because there's only about a year, they, they, this, the state of the medical art is such that about a year of care is going to get you as far as, as you're going to get. We'll do everything we can for you, but that doesn't mean staying in hospital forever. I mean, we, we will work on you, but when we can't do anything more, we can't do anything more, and that's when we'll discharge you. The hospital's need for manpower is actually a recruiting tool. You know, join the Army to help these guys recuperate. I don't know if that's a successful uh, pitch, but there's also a series of posters saying, join the Army and learn a trade. So you could, you know, that was probably more successful. Uh, they also were, are working on the patients. Um, to, you know, uh, Social historians have gotten a lot, uh, um, gotten into this and talked about what these posters, and this is just one poster. There's actually posters for the blind, um, which is great if you think about it. Yeah, poster. Yeah. Um, you know, the social historians talk about what it means, you know, restoring manhood and, and whatnot. Yeah, okay, there's that element to it. But it's going to be reassuring to me if I can have some confidence that I can get a job. I am not going to be unable to provide for myself and go on, oh, wait, there is no Social Security disability. I, I am out of luck. Um, medical uh, rehab training includes job training, uh, something that's now in the VA, not in the Army. Uh, but <coughs> uh, and these, uh, this guy on the top has got one hook and one hand, and the, the guy at the bottom has two hooks. So they're, they're trying to train them to do all kinds of things. Now, I mentioned the, the flu a, a couple of times. It may have started, started on an army base in Kansas. It may have started over in China. 
Uh, but the army certainly spreads it around the country by moving troops. Um, the army makes it, probably makes it more virulent by crowding people together. Uh, so the, the flu will hop between people, it, the normal mutations will just get more chances to mutate. And the war effort, not just the army, but the war spreads it around. Philadelphia had a major rally to sell uh, Liberty Loan uh, bonds. The, the city public health commissioner said, don't do this, it will spread disease. And they said, well, no, no, we need, to, we need to sell our quota of bonds. Oh, and they sold their quota of bonds, and then they had thousands of people die. Well, probably most of them were immigrants anyway. Uh, that would have been more the uh, view of the city leadership. Uh, for the impact in the army, a quarter of the army is admitted for respiratory diseases during the war, and that's going to be an undercount. If, you're, uh, if the hospital is full, if they, uh, they punched your card as being you know, something else with respiratory second, you're not counted as respiratory. Uh, uh, the flu is more widespread in the U.S., 24% uh, versus about 14% over in Europe, and that's because the mild flu mostly immunized you against the second lethal flu. Uh, but you also got the bronchitis, the pneumonia. Um, TB is, is a respiratory disease, but it's not part of this pandemic. Uh, the flu, of course, the flu kills uh, probably 25,000 soldiers uh, and the comorbidities, uh, the pneumonia um, uh, that you got from lying in bed for uh, a couple weeks with the flu uh, killed people too. I hope when we get our next pandemic flu, we haven't, uh, we still have some antiviral drugs and some antibiotics. Otherwise, we're going to get another thing like this. Um, it was mentioned the flu had a, uh, was very hard on the, uh, the young and fit. You know, normally, flu has a U-shaped mortality curve, kills the very young and the very old. Um, the 1918 pandemic was W-shaped because it triggered your uh, immune system into uh, fighting too hard. And your lungs, uh, normally, you, you, mucus is a defense mechanism. You, it, uh, you cough it up and you get rid of germs that way. If you're producing too much mucus, you drown on your own mucus uh, with your lungs flooding. Or people died within 24 hours. Uh, so th that is clearly a flu because there was no way pneumonia could kill you that fast. So in conclusion, um, there were real problems for the medical department. The flu was a huge problem. Uh, really nothing anybody could do about that. Mental health was another problem, uh, both for the department and, of, of course, for the people uh, and the families that would be dealing with it for years to come. Uh, the enthusiasm, the surgeon's enthusiasm for Carol Dakin's solution was a dead end. Um, you know, uh, science and, and research are full of dead ends. Um, that one just ha was the one that happened during World War I. But they learned things like, learned things like debridement, which are standard today. But I think the medical department's war was, uh, they had an, a, a good war. Um, Disease did not cripple the Army's ability to fight, so they delivered a healthy enough Army to the battlefield. Uh, and then they provided the best medical care they could, uh, granted the, the shortage of hospitals that really wasn't their fault. Uh, they did the best uh, casualty care that they could. And I'll close by asking you to remember the, uh, the, the soldiers and nurses that cared for their fellow soldiers on behalf of the nation. Thank you. Got time for questions? In your research, have you been able to come across any individual medical records for those in France? No. Uh, I also have not looked. I have not looked for individual medical records. Um, typically, uh, the Army used punch cards, um, the exciting new technology of the day, uh, to send data back, but that was much more in the diagnosis end of things. They certainly had individual medical records. Um, I suspect a lot of those burned in St. Louis in the National Personnel Records Center fire in 1973, but I, I have not.
looking at the history of war, if you looked at how from the Revolutionary War, Civil War, to the uh, World War I or World War II, how the different peaks and valleys came about, whereas in, like in the Civil War, we say that most of them died. If you, got, if you were wounded, you were dead, versus in World War I, World War II, and for the future. Have you looked at any of that? There's, yes. Um, leith, uh, with antibiotics, we've been able, to, and, and well, with good surgery, uh, improving surgery and antibiotics, um, survival uh, from being wounded has gone up dramatically. Uh, our data sets um, from before the Civil War are very incomplete. Uh, they're not great for the Civil War. There's a lot of data, but it doesn't match the way we categorize things now. Uh, plus, they didn't have antibiotics. So yes, if you were shot in the gut, you were probably going to die. If you were shot in the arm, probably not. They, they could cut off the arm and stop the bleeding, or just stop the bleeding, depending on, on how serious the wound is. Uh, World War I, you, if you got back to a hospital, um, you probably had a 92% survival chance if you're wounded. World War II, that goes up to about 95.5%. Uh, today, it's hard to figure out exactly what's qualifying as a wound because if, if, PT, if PTSD gets you a purple heart and getting hit by something gets you a purple heart, your denominator for, for statistical purposes is different. So we, we can look at people evacuated from theater as the, as the denominator, but if, you're, uh, if, if you broke your leg, they will fly you out now rather than have a hospital in, in theater. So it is better today. Uh, I, I, it is over 95% chance of surviving if you get back to a hospital, probably in the 96, 97% chance. Um, uh, but we're also dealing with things today if a uh, soldier is 100 meters away from a 500 pound bomb that blows up he's probably got you know, if he gets to a hospital alive he's got that 97% chance in World War I if he was 100 meters from a 500 pound bomb he wouldn't have gone to a hospital so he would have been counted as killed in action not died of wounds so the statistics um, it's, it's really hard to do apples to apples to apples uh, over, over different time periods because the wounding mechanisms change, you know, the causes of wounds change, uh, the medical ca capabilities change, and the enemy's capabilities change. If, if we are unable to fly helicopters in the next fight, our, we're going to have more people dying. Uh, uh, not just the helicopter pilots, but the, the people who get wounded will, will die before they get to it back to a doctor. Uh, but yeah, but you know, medical care has improved over that 240 year period. So yes, we are having fewer people dying uh, from wounds. One thing I would like to point out, I believe World War I is one of the first wars where you're, more, you're far less likely to die of disease than you would from wounds. Yeah. Where Civil War, about two-thirds two or three-quarters were died of disease, whereas World War I, you had people dying of disease, but you had a much better chance of get, staying alive without actually getting shot up, where unlike previous wars, that's where the sanitation part came in, is it really helped cut back on non-battle deaths. Uh, if you leave the flu out, then yes, more people die from battle than die from disease. If you, th you know, if you say the flu is part of the war, which it, which it is, then still in World War I, more people die from disease. But yeah, in the Civil War, it's, it's two or three to one. Um, and even in the Spanish-American War, of course, a lot fewer people dying, but they're dying from dysentery and, and typhoid, uh, which by World War I, are preventable because they know the cause of the disease. Walter Reed is famous for yellow fever, but he's also, he and a couple other guys figured out 
that if the fly lands on the poop and then picks up germs from the poop and then flies over to the kitchen and lands on the food and then the soldier eats the food, the soldier is basically eating poop. Go figure. Uh, and you know they fig uh, realize that even though it's three weeks later, the guy who's getting sick with typhoid is uh, sick because he was eating the food and the fly, uh, so he, they figure out the science behind preventive medicine and they figure out how to uh, do water purification. Um, the hospital at Fort Hood is named for Carl Darnall. Carl Darnall, he invented uh, using chlorine in public water supplies. Pretty useful for the army, but it's useful for a lot of other people too. At the top of the roof. You had a slide up earlier, and it showed the military hospitals yeah. in the United States, but. Bamsey in San Antonio at Fort Sam? No, I didn't see a red dot. Correct. Um, not real active. At the, I mean, well, not not a big. There were that those dots were uh, a category called general hospital. There was a station hospital at Fort Sam. Um, thank you. Uh, Fort every military post had a station hospital. Um, it, it's you know for the guys who get sick or you know twist their ankle jumping down off a wagon. Um, these are, are think, uh, referral centers. So if you really smash your leg, um, you would go to uh, be sent to one of these. Uh, the, uh, the one red dot is down at, uh, that was a, a hotel that uh, in Corpus, that, that a resort hotel that somebody persuaded the army to lease. Uh, I think so. Uh, um, it, was, it was too small to be useful. It was only about 150 beds. I have to think that, that somebody twisted somebody's arm to lease that particular hotel at, a, at an outrageous amount of money. Um, I, I am too. It's, it, it was a first. Uh, but that was, a, that was the one general hospital in Texas, but every uh, uh, camp in Texas had a, uh, a hospital. Sure. Are there any other questions? Well, thanks for your attention. <laughs>